complex numbers are great at rotating. That makes them extremely useful to study rotations and waves in engineering and physics. Of course, you could describe a rotation using separate x and y coordinates. But that would mean that you have to keep track of two separate parts all the time, juggling lots of trig identities and Pythagoras formulas along the way. Instead, we can bundle those two parts into a single number and then perform arithmetic on that number. This leads to shorter formulas and easier calculations, because we need only one number instead of two. That's the main reason why complex numbers are used all over the place in physics and engineering. And remember that a sine wave is just a rotation that you project on the vertical axis. So complex numbers are also used for describing sound waves, electromagnetic waves, and even probability waves. Last time, we already looked at the geometry of addition and multiplication in the complex plane. In this video, I want to look at powers and roots. We already saw that multiplication corresponds to rotation. So repeated multiplication should correspond to repeated rotation allowing us to produce various kinds of discrete and continuous wave patterns. Let's start with a simple example. When you raise the number minus 1 to successive powers of 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, you get a sequence of results that alternate between minus 1 and plus 1. This is often used as a kind of flip switch. Whenever you see this minus 1 to the nth power in a mathematical formula, you know that you will get a sign that flips between negative and positive all the time. That's a cool trick, and we can extend it by using complex numbers. Let's raise the imaginary unit i to successive integer powers. i to the first is, of course, i itself and i squared is negative 1, by definition. Then we reach negative i, and finally i to the fourth equals 1. I say finally because once we reach this point, the cycle just repeats forever. Hey, look at that! Instead of a flip switch that oscillates between two different states, we now get something that oscillates between four different states. Its vertical projection creates a discrete wave. So with integer powers of i, we can get multiples of 90 degrees. Can we get other angles as well? For example, how can we rotate over an angle of 45 degrees? Easy. We just multiply with a number that, in polar coordinates, has an angle of 45 degrees and a modulus of 1. The modulus of 1 guarantees that we get a pure rotation without stretching or shrinking. So the complex number we're looking for is right here. For its rectangular coordinates, you take its cosine and sine. But polar coordinates are much more natural when thinking about rotations. Obviously, when we rotate over 45 degrees twice in a row, we end up with a total rotation of 90 degrees. In algebraic terms, this means that when we multiply our number by itself, we get i. This means that our number is a square root of i. We can also write that as i raised to the power of one half. And now we begin to notice an interesting pattern. If we want to rotate over half a straight angle, we have to raise i to the power of one half. I hope you can see that we can easily generalize this idea to other angles as well. i raised to the one-third gives us one-third of a straight angle, or a rotation of 30 degrees. i raised to the one-fifth gives us an angle of 18 degrees, and so on. What we have discovered here is that we can easily obtain any angle we want by just raising i to the corresponding power. With real exponents, we can reach every possible angle, even tiny angles close to zero. 
we typically want to express our angles in radians. So instead of i to the power of 1, we want to say i to the power of something times pi over 2. That's easy enough. Just multiply your angle by 2 over pi to get the correct result. Great! So powers of i give us the ability to rotate around the unit circle over any angle we want. Because of this amazing ability, you would expect powers of i to turn up everywhere in mathematical formulas. Well, yes, they do, but they always appear in disguise. Instead of powers of i, mathematicians prefer to use powers of e instead. The crucial thing to realize, though, is that this change of base from i to e is not really a big deal. The underlying goal is still the same. Complex powers allow us to rotate around the unit circle, regardless of which number we use as the base of those powers. So instead of powers of i, mathematicians use the famous e to the i times theta, known as Euler's formula. The main goal of this video is to explore where this formula comes from and how we can interpret it geometrically. I mean, think about how weird this is. Raising something to an imaginary power? What on earth could that possibly mean? But also, just look at how elegant this formula is. We can just plug our angle in radians into the exponent and we're done. We don't need a factor like 2 over pi to convert it from radians into something else. Euler's formula is simple and perfect. If we plug an angle of pi radians into the formula, we get the famous relation between pi, e, i, and minus 1. This is a popular choice for the most beautiful formula in math, because it combines so many fundamental constants in a totally unexpected way. Okay, the powers of i are very intuitive, but Euler's formula is not. In the previous video we talked about polar coordinates. When you multiply two complex numbers, you have to add their angles. Multiplication becomes addition. So perhaps it should be no surprise that the exponential function plays a role here. After all, that's one of the things that exponentials and logarithms do. They manage to convert multiplication into addition and vice versa. But still, how can we get more familiar with Euler's formula? What does taking an imaginary power of a number mean? What does it look like geometrically? I did some online research and I found three different explanations that make Euler's formula more intuitive. I will introduce each explanation in turn, keeping my personal favorite for last. For those of you who want to take more time to pour over all the details, I will point you to the best videos I could find on the web. Here is a good start. Take the good old polar form of a complex number. I use a number on the unit circle so that we can ignore its modulus. The modulus just equals 1. The x and y components of this point are the cosine of theta and i times the sine of theta. Now think of this expression as a function of theta. As we increase theta, our function spits out different complex numbers that walk around the unit circle. Ask yourself what would happen if we take the derivative of this function. The first term turns into minus sine theta. The second one has an i in the front. And then the cosine of theta. Now bring the number i outside the parentheses. We can easily get rid of the i in the denominator over here. And there's the result. Hang on. This part inside the parentheses is exactly the same expression that we started from. So the derivative of this function is the function itself, with an extra factor of i. The only function that is its own derivative is the exponential function. So we see that our function must be e to the i theta. The i in the exponent is just there to give us the factor of i in the derivative. 
Okay, okay, I admit, this explanation uses algebra and calculus. What you want is a geometric intuition. Well, it's your lucky day, because there are a few videos that explain this derivative in a visual way. Let's start at theta equal to zero, at the right side of the circle. Remember, multiplication by i is a 90 degree rotation. So the factor of i at the front means that the derivative is vertical. Then, remember from physics that the derivative can be interpreted as a velocity. This vertical velocity launches you on a circular trajectory around the origin. Along the way, the velocity is always orthogonal to the radius of the circle. If you're at least a little bit comfortable with classical mechanics, you can find more details in these two videos, one by Jahan and another by 3 blue one brown The links are in the description below. The most common proof for Euler's formula starts from the Taylor series of the exponential function. You fill in an imaginary number, such as i times theta. Then you use the powers of i, and you pull out the Taylor series for sine and cosine. This is a very cool proof, but again, it uses algebra and calculus. I am not aware of any geometric interpretation for this proof. If you want to dive more deeply into this particular proof, I recommend Eddie Wu's lecture. He starts from scratch and explains the full proof to a class full of students. You can literally hear their surprise when the final result pops out. It's actually very entertaining. Anyway, here is my favorite geometric interpretation of Euler's formula. Not only does it explain complex exponentiation, it even gives you an interesting view on the good old exponential function itself. The main idea is really simple. Whenever you have a long journey to make, you can divide it into n smaller parts. And then you execute all of those parts in sequence. In this case, to reach a point on the unit circle at an angle theta, we divide theta into n tiny angles epsilon. We then repeatedly rotate by this tiny angle n times to reach the total angle theta. Epsilon is just one nth of the total angle, and n is the number of steps we're going to take. Let's zoom in on a single tiny rotation first. I want to convince you that when we rotate by this tiny angle, what happens is that we actually move straight up from the number one. I know it's not exactly straight up, but almost. It's a good approximation and it gets closer to vertical as we make n larger. Just like the velocity vector earlier, the rotation begins by moving straight up along the line that is tangent to the circle at the number one. In fact, that is exactly what tangent lines are all about. They tell you the direction in which a curve is moving. At the real number one, the circle is moving straight up along its tangent line. So a rotation by a tiny angle epsilon is actually a multiplication with a complex number over here, above the number one, but still very close to the real number line. You can write this number using its real and imaginary parts. The real part is one, and the imaginary part is epsilon times i. All we have to do now is simply repeat this tiny rotation n times. Let's do a few of them, one by one. If you look carefully, you will see that we are already slightly above the horizontal axis. So this time, when we make a 90 degree turn, instead of going straight up, we rotate a little bit more to the left. As we pile these tiny rotations on top of each other, we start moving up and left along the unit circle. Well, I should say we start moving almost along the unit circle. But again, the approximation gets better and better as we make epsilon smaller, or equivalently, as we make n larger. The total angle is the sum of those n tiny angles. 
but the final complex number is the product of the n tiny rotations. So the formula for our total rotation is a product of n factors. Each of those factors is our tiny rotation 1 plus i times epsilon. Finally, to make the approximation better, we have to let n go to infinity. In the limit, we rotate around the circle in infinitely many steps. Each of those steps is an infinitely small rotation. Some of you may have already noticed that this limit is exactly the well-known definition of the exponential function. Honestly, that shouldn't really surprise you. After all, we have a repeated product here, where all the factors are identical. And what do you call a repeated multiplication? That's right, it's a power, or an exponential. In the limit, this becomes a continuous repeated product. The number of factors goes to infinity, and the factors themselves get ever closer to 1. At the risk of repeating myself, allow me to repeat myself. Our total angle is a sum of tiny angles theta over n. The rotation itself is a product, a repeated multiplication of n identical tiny rotations. We just make this repeated product continuous by taking the limit. To reach the angle theta, we have to perform an infinitesimal rotation infinitely many times. And that's exactly what the exponential function does. It repeats a tiny transformation multiple times. Mathematicians say that the tiny rotation 1 plus i epsilon generates all the other continuous rotations. This is a deep result, and I can't overstate its importance. Note this i in the exponent. We raise e to a purely imaginary power. Let me plot the exponent on the imaginary axis. As we move our value of i theta vertically along the axis, the exponential rotates further along the unit circle. Later, we will talk about Lie groups and Lie algebras. In that context, it will make sense to move the vertical axis to the right, and think of it as the tangent line to the circle at the number 1. Indeed, the rotation always begins at 1 along the tangent line. This tangent line will play a huge role in understanding continuous symmetries such as the rotational symmetries of a circle. Each point on the tangent line will be mapped to the circle by an exponential map. This is one of the key aspects of Lie groups, the study of continuous symmetries. You now understand one of the simplest examples of a Lie group, the group of circle rotations. Details will follow in future videos. For more exposition, I recommend this Mathologer video, where he explains to Homer Simpson how this definition of the exponential function works. The explanation involves interest on a bank account. It shows you what happens when compound interest becomes continuous, and it animates the limit process as it spirals towards the unit circle. After talking about the powers of complex numbers, I also briefly want to mention something about their roots. In particular, I want to talk about the complex roots of the number 1, which are known as the roots of unity. Here's an example. This complex number, let's call it eta, is at 45 degrees on the unit circle. If you square it, you get twice the angle, so you land at i. Multiply by eta again, and you get this point. The powers of eta allow you to go around the unit circle in discrete steps. After 8 steps, you end up all the way on the right, and then the cycle repeats. Because the 8th power of eta is 1, eta is an 8th root of unity. You can do this for any natural number n, dividing the unit circle into n parts, with an nth root of unity. This allows you to describe polygons with complex numbers. Many, many interesting results, especially in number theory, make use of this fairly simple idea. Remember that it can be very useful 
to have an expression that flips around between n different values. Complex roots allow you to do this elegantly, with discrete rotations. That's it for this video. I hope you now have at least an initial intuition for the magic behind Euler's formula. Again, if you want to dig deeper, I've left quite a few links in the description. The easiest way to make a contribution is to give this video a thumbs up. That tells the YouTube algorithm that more people need to learn about Euler's formula. Please subscribe to the channel and share this video. You can also get early access to new videos on Patreon.